السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد إن شاء الله today we're going to talk about a topic that is something that's very rarely discussed it's something that it's very unfortunate and upsetting that we find especially in our days very very few people talk about this subject yet it's more fitting for us in these times than for anybody else the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam informed us that every single prophet from the time of adam alaihi salam until muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam all of them warned their nations about the fitna of al-masih ad-dajjal this means that Adam alayhi salam, even though his people wouldn't live in those times, because it would be the greatest fitna to ever occur in all of history, they warned their people about this. Yet we find in our times it's something that is very rarely discussed. Now, before we go into anything, I always like to remind our brothers and sisters of the importance of knowing our history. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, tells us to understand our past for a reason. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَن تَجِدَ لِسُنَّةِ اللَّهِ تَبَدِيلًا You will not find that the sunnah of Allah changes. What does this mean? Allah has a sunnah. Allah has a way in which He decrees that things would occur. You find that history tends to repeat itself. This is why we're supposed to understand what happened before. You find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He tells us about our history, it's not like when you're in class. You know at school when you say history, a lot of people, they begin to fall asleep. You think, history, man, it's boring. I have to remember names and places and years. This is not what Allah teaches us about history. Allah teaches about the lessons and the morals. When we think, for example, of the Battle of Uhud, if I were to ask you, does it matter what year it occurred? Does it matter how hot it was that day? Does it matter how many people were there? Really, this is not what we care about. The lesson of the battle of Uhud is about obeying Allah and His Messenger and the effect of disobeying Him. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed verses after the battle of Uhud of the battle of Uhud, where he said, dunya wa al-akhira. There are some of you who prefer this dunya, meaning they wanted the ghanima. And then there are those of you who want the akhira, the hereafter. And you disobeyed Allah after you saw that which you love. Allah is teaching us lessons here about obeying the messenger. This is what the battle of Uhud was about. This is what Islamic history is about. So that we can prepare from knowing what happened yesterday to be ready for today and the future. Now, knowing the past is one important thing. And every single nation on the face of the earth is able to study history. It doesn't matter whether you be Muslim or Kafir. Everyone can study history. But we as an Ummah have one gift from Allah that no nation on the face of the earth has. And that is that we know parts of our future. No other nation has this. Every nation can only guess. As for us, we know parts of our future. This is a gift that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us so that we can be prepared. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam told us of things that would happen. Some of which have happened and others are to occur in the future. And we know that the Prophet ﷺ does not speak from his own desires. Rather, he speaks from revelation from Allah. I remember for myself, as a new Muslim, reading you know, some of the signs of the last day. And one of the signs that I read about was that there would be a day when barefooted Bedouins would compete with each other in building high, large towers. And I remember reading this hadith thinking... How, how could it be barefooted Bedouins building large towers? You can barely comprehend how this would occur. Yet we see this in our lifetime. I remember being in Dubai 
where they have this world's largest tower and now the Saudis want to build a bigger one and Abu Dhabi wants to build a bigger one. I remember meeting one of the managers who was in charge of the construction of this Burj Khalifa and he said, you know, when I was a young boy, we were Bedouins. I used to play in the desert with my brothers, barefooted. Sadaqa Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is telling us based upon what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised. And we know that his words are true just as the words of Allah are true. So anything that he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has told us will occur. We have no doubt about this. So we as Muslims should know about this. Because we wouldn't be told about something unless it's relevant for this ummah. This is why it's important that we talk about the coming of Al-Masih al-Dajjal. Now, as I mentioned, there will be no trial in all of history, in the history of mankind, there will be no trial greater than that of Al-Masih al-Dajjal. All prophets warned about him, even the Jews and the Christians. You find the Jews and the Christians in their own books, it mentions Al-Masih al-Dajjal. But no doubt, just as their books became changed over time, so too did their understanding of Al-Masih al-Dajjal. So the Prophet ﷺ came to clarify these things. And that's why we as an ummah, just as we know the truth about Allah, we know the truth about this world and the akhirah, whereas the Jews and the Christians have a distorted understanding, we know the haqq, we know the reality of Al-Masih al-Dajjal, whereas them, they're still following their distorted and changed understanding we see that the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam emphasized why we should know and prepare for and seek refuge in this trial to the point that he would teach the sahaba he would teach the sahaba to make a dua in your salat asking allah for protection from al masih al dajjal and the sahaba they said the prophet of allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam would teach us this dua like he would teach us the quran Meaning he would place such an emphasis on knowing this. It was as if he was teaching them Quran. Making sure they would repeat it back to him and they would have it memorized exactly. And he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam taught us to say, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min a'adhabi jahannam wa min a'adhabi al-qabr wa min fitnati al-mahya wal mamat wa min sharri al-fitnati al-masih al-dajjal. He would say to seek refuge in the punishment of Jahannam, the punishment of the grave, the fitna of life and death, and the fitna of the danger of Al-Masih al-Dajjal. Now, many of the ulama of the past held this to be a compulsory part of your salat. The vast majority disagree, but a minority of the ulama believe that after finishing the tashahud and the salawat al-Ibrahimiyyah, that this dua is compulsory. One of the ulama of the past, when his son had finished praying, he said to his son, did you make dua seeking protection from the danger and the trial of Al-Masih al-Dajjal? And he said, no, I haven't. He said, go back and repeat your prayer because your prayer is incomplete. So it's a shame that many of us, we don't even know this dua. We don't even know it exists. It's never even been mentioned from our tongues. And this is perhaps one of the reasons why we as an ummah today, unlike all of the nations before, we don't even talk about Al-Masih al-Dajjal. Very, very rarely mentioned. Now pay attention to this. Pay attention because at the end I'm going to repeat this. We never hear anybody talking about Al-Masih al-Dajjal. When was the last time you heard the Juma khutbah? When was the last time you heard an imam on the minbar talking about Al-Masih al-Dajjal? Most of us will go our entire lives without ever hearing about this. As I said, keep this in mind because we're going to mention something about this at the end, inshallah. So we were warned. Every single nation in the history of mankind was warned about the coming of Al-Masih al-Dajjal. Now the word Dajjal itself Al-Masih, we know what it means. What does Al-Masih mean? The Messiah. And who is Al-Masih? Isa alayhi salam. Now Messiah can also be translated in the English as Christ. 
It means exactly the same thing. Masih comes from Arabic and Semitic languages. Christ is the Greek version of it. They have exactly the same meaning. So we as Muslims, when we say Jesus Christ, this is an acceptable term. We're saying Isa al-Masih. So al-Masih means the Messiah. As for al-Dajjal, Dajjal it means someone who deceives. Somebody who misleads you. Somebody who covers his true nature. This is the meaning of a Dajjal. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, told us that the hour, meaning the last day, would not come until 30, 30 Dajjalun, 30 of these deceivers would appear on the face of the earth, claiming to be prophets and messengers. Now, no doubt we know that many people have come claiming to be prophets and messengers. At the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him, there was Musaylam al kadhab Musaylam the liar, who claimed to be a prophet. In previous times, we had Mirza Ghulam Ahmad of the Qadiani sect, who claimed to be a prophet. We had in our days Rashad Khalifa, this American mathematician who invented this number 19 miracle in the Quran, also claiming to be a prophet of Allah until one of our brothers, may Allah reward him, killed him inside of his masjid. Because this is the punishment for anyone who claims to be a prophet of Allah when they are not. The Prophet, peace be upon him, told us that 30, 30 of these Dajjalun, these deceivers, would come claiming to be prophets and messengers. However, al Masih al Dajjal is not going to claim to be a prophet or a messenger. No. al Masih al Dajjal isn't going to stop at this level. Rather, al Masih al Dajjal is going to claim to be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This will be his claim. Now, when you hear this, you might seem amazed. I mean, if someone claimed to be, for example, Imam Mahdi, as I met one of them in India, at one of the talks, he came up and he claimed that he was Imam Mahdi. There's many of them. To claim to be a prophet, I mean, this is something that is, of course, we don't accept it, but your mind would understand why some misguided people would understand that yes, a person can be a prophet. But to claim to be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who in their right mind would accept this? Even the kafir agrees that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has to be great and majestic and glorious. How could a human being claim to be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? But this is what makes the fitna so much worse. This is what makes the trial of al-Masih al-Dajjal so much more severe. And this is what we're going to see. Now we know that the Dajjal will be a man. He will be a man from among the sons of Adam alayhi salam. This is very important to note. That the Nasih al-Dajjal is not an alien. He's not a ghost. He's not a country or a system. He's not you know, on the American one dollar bill. He's not any of this. al Masih al-Dajjal is a man from the sons of Adam alayhi salam. If you hear anything otherwise, know that the person speaking is foolish. Know that the person speaking himself is a deceiver and a liar. Masih had the Jal will be a man from the sons of Adam. He will have many attributes that the, that the Prophet, peace be upon him, described to us in the Ahadith. The, the Prophet, peace be upon him, told us so much of how he will be. He described him. Why? So that we would recognize who he is. In the same way that the Prophet, peace be upon him, described the characteristics of Imam Mahdi. For the reason that we would know who he is. So that not just anyone can come along and say, I am Imam Mahdi. No, he has characteristics. There's a checklist. So too with Al-Masih al-Dajjal. So that the believer who's aware and studies and prepares for this, will know who he is, so that we could be protected from his evil. And so he told us, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, these distinguishing features, and among these attributes that the Prophet, peace be upon him, told us about him, would be that he would be a young man. He would be a young man. Al-Masih al-Dajjal will be young. And he would have a reddish complexion. Now, when we hear the word reddish, if I say someone has a reddish complexion, in English, we think it means someone with red skin. In Arabic, this is not the case. You're going to find in the Arabic language, many colors are used to describe things that to us seem odd. 
For example, in English, if I was to ask you what color is water, what would you say? Clear. Blue, clear, white. This is usually what we think of. If you had to draw a picture of water, you'd either use blue or white. Yet in the Arabic language, water is called black. At the time of the Prophet wasallam, he would say, we'd survived many months on only the two black things, which were dates and water. Now, the reason why he called it black is because living in the desert, you don't see the ocean, nor do you see rivers. Where is water kept? It's kept in containers or it's kept in wells. So when you look at it, there's no light. What color does it look? It looks black. So you're going to find in the Arabic language, some of the, some of the colors they use seem strange to us. So when the Prophet ﷺ says he will have a reddish complexion, he actually means white. You would see that the Arabs would refer to the Romans or the Byzantines as being red. To the point that the Arab women would be jealous of the Roman women because of their light skin. I don't know what it is about women in general, but when they're white, they want to be dark. When they're dark, they want to be white. So you'd find that the Arab women, being darker in color, would be jealous of the lighter women of the Roman Empire. And so the Arabs, they used to, if they wanted, for example, to you know, be romantic with their wife, they would refer to them as you know, being white. So the Prophet wasallam, he used to refer to our mother Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, as Humaira. Humaira means you know, the little, it's the tasghir, like the diminutive form of Red or white. So it's saying, oh, my little, you know, my white dear, for example. This is what he, sallallahu alayhi wa would use as a compliment to her. Because she would be jealous of the whiter women, so he would call her. He'd say, oh, you're so fair, for example. I mean, for a lot of us in Australia, we don't really understand this. But in the Arabian Peninsula, this is how they would be. So when he describes al-Masih al-Dajjal as red, it means he's white. So the Dajjal will be a white man. And a lot of people, they say it's no surprise because you white people are the most wicked of them all. <laughs> I neither confirm nor deny this. But Al-Masih al-Dajjal will be a white man with a white complexion. He will be short. He will be a short man with thick and curly hair. He will have a very wide forehead, a very wide forehead, and a very broad upper chest. He will be blind or he will have a either blind or a defective right eye. As we say in Arabic, it is mamsuh. Now this can either mean blind or defective. In this eye, it will neither be prominent, meaning it's not coming out, nor is it sunken. It's a normal eye. And it will look like a floating grape. For a person who's blind, you see a lot of people, they don't have any color whatsoever in their eye. So it almost looks like a grape that is of one color. Now it's important to note that I said he does have two eyes. He has a right eye and a left eye. He's going to be blind or his sight will be defective in his right eye. A lot of people, I don't know why, they hear that the Dajjal has one eye. So they're, accept, you know, they're expecting a cyclops. <laughs> As if there's going to be a man with one eye in the middle of his head. And this, of course, is wrong. I'm sure many of you... You know, saw these emails and this news on the internet saying that Dajjal has been born. Because there was a baby born in India who had one eye. This happens. It's a medical thing that happens. This baby was born with one eye. So many Muslims, hey, it's Dajjal. And of course, this is entirely nonsense. The Dajjal will have two eyes, but he will be blind or defective in one of those eyes. Now, Ibn Umar radiallahu an narrated that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Allah is not one-eyed. Allah is not one-eyed. But know that verily Al-Masih al-Dajjal is one eye. He is blind or defective in one of his eyes with that eye looking like a grape. So being one-eyed means one of his eyes is not functioning, but one of them is. This is what it means that he is one-eyed. It does not mean at all that he is a cyclops. Now, his right eye will be dull, and it will be, and sorry, his left one will be covered with some flesh. So actually, both of his eyes are defective to one degree. His right eye is more so than the left. His left eye will be covered with a little bit of flesh. So the skin, it goes higher on his eye than a normal eye would. Now you might be wondering at this point, this young man, 
he's very short, he's blind in one eye, his other eye, you know, the skin is, you know, deformed. Of all of the people to claim to be Allah, how could this man, who's imperfect, blind in one eye, claim to be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? This is what you'd wonder. I mean, even the kuffar who claim that Allah came to earth, they will always describe him in the best way. So beautiful, so charming. Yet the reality is that Al-Masih al-Dajjal is going to be a very ugly man. He's going to be ugly. He's not going to be beautiful. He's going to be deformed in many ways. So this makes it even more confusing as to why people would claim that he would be Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now written between his eyes, written between the eyes, it will be written in Arabic, Kaf, Fa, Ra. Kaf, Fa, Ra. Meaning Kafara. Or according to some narrations, saying Kafir. Now it will be written between his eyes. Now you, again, you question, how could this be? That a man has it written between his eyes, Kafir. And people aren't going to realize that he is Al-Masih al-Dajjal. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said, this will be visible. And every Muslim, every true mu'min will be able to see this and read this and understand this, whether they be literate or illiterate. And again, the question comes, how can an illiterate person who can neither read nor write understand what it says? Now, we know, for example, that it's possible. You know, for example, a person who can't read or write, he comes into the masjid and he sees in big letters the name of Allah. Even a person who can't read or write, he knows that it says Allah from experience. So it could be. I mean, it's not every day that you see someone with Arabic letters written on their foreheads. So even an illiterate Muslim is going to know that this means he is Al-Masih al-Dajjal. That this says Kafara or Kafir. As Imam al-Nawawi rahimahullah said, the correct view according to those who studied this issue is that the writing is something literal. It is literal. It's not a metaphor for something. I remember speaking to someone from Turkey and he was saying that Ataturk was the Dajjal. Ataturk, Mustafa Kamal, was the Dajjal. And we said, what's your proof for this? And he said, you see, because before Ataturk, all of the Turks, they used to wear the fez. You know, this red type of hat and it's flat. They used to wear this. And the purpose of the fez is that you can wear it when you're praying. You can make sajda and your head can still touch the grounds. However, Ataturk, he forbade wearing this hat. He actually passed a specific law about what type of hats are legal and illegal. So a kufi or a fez, these were made illegal. And the only hat you could wear was the western type bowler hat. Now this type of hat, you can't make sajda with this. So some of them said, ah, because you can't make sajda, this represents kufr. And because he used to wear this hat, it's like he has kufr written on his head. And this is not true. They're trying to use a metaphor when this is something literal. As Imam al-Nawai said, that it will be a, writ a, a real writing. A literal writing on his head that will be a sign created by Allah. That will be a proof that he is Al-Masih al-Dajjal to expose his falsehood to every single Muslim, literate or illiterate. So, he will have this written across his eye, between his eyes. Another is that he will be sterile. What does sterile mean? It means he will not be able to have any children. So as for those of us who have children, Mabrook, you're not the Dajjal. As for those who don't have children, yalla, get busy so that we know you're not the Dajjal. <laughs> so you see that there are many descriptions that the Prophet, peace be upon him, has given us about who he would be. So we know without doubt that he is not, as some people say, a system. And I should mention, I mean, I'll mention his name just in case anybody gets confused. There is one person whose name is Imran Hussein. Now, Imran Hussein is one of the very few people who talk about Al-Masih al-Dajjal. However, unfortunately, most of what he mentions is nonsense. This is as well 
one of the signs of the confusion that's going to come about. The few people that do talk about the Dajjal lie about him. Imran Hussein and some of his followers, they say, no, no, no. Dajjal is not a person. Dajjal is America. Or Dajjal is Israel. Or Dajjal is the Freemasons or the Illuminati. And I'm sorry to say this, but any Muslim who talks to me and says the word Illuminati with a belief in it, my respect for him diminishes. It means this is a person who is not educated, nor do they concern themselves with authenticating any knowledge. We as Muslims have to know about the reality. Yes, the Freemasons are a real group. They evolved from the Crusades, from the Knights Templar, and their mission, as it was at the time of the Crusades, is to weaken the Muslim Ummah. As for the Illuminati, they do not exist. Yes, there was a group a long time ago during the you know, time of the Enlightenment in Europe called the Bavarian Illuminati, and they died out. Many centuries later, a person wrote a fiction novel, and he decided to use this name, the Illuminati, based upon this group. And he wrote this novel about how this group is trying to secretly conquer the world. It was a fiction novel, like the Da Vinci Codes, or Spot Goes to the Zoo. It's not real. Now, some people read this and thought, ah, maybe it's real. And by time, people swear that it's real. And many Muslims, unfortunately, repeat this nonsense. It is not real. The Dajjal, as the Prophet, peace be upon him, described, is a man. He is from the sons of Adam, alayhi salam. So all of these other things, like the Freemasons and all of this, forget about it. There are many brothers and possibly sisters, may Allah guide them, who spend so much time reading about the Freemasons. As for Sahih Bukhari, as for the Book of Allah, leave it on the shelf for now. The Freemasons are more interesting. It's more juicy. And this is wasting your time. You should know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has power over all things. Allah has all might and no human being has any might. All human beings belong to Allah and they will return to Allah. They are not able to live for even a second longer than Allah decrees. Nor do they have any power except that which Allah has granted them. Forget about this. You want to protect yourself. Know the religion of Allah. Don't waste your time reading any of this nonsense. So the Dajjal is a man. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, just to reinforce, in case you think there's any doubt that he might still be a system, a one-eyed system with thick curly hair, and I don't know how you're going to misunderstand this, but just to reinforce this, the Prophet ﷺ said that the Dajjal, the Masih dajjal most resembled a man whose name was Abdul Uzza ibn Qatan. He said he most resembled this man, who was a man who was known to Quraysh. He was one of the Mushrikun. He most resembled him, meaning in his features, so that some of the Sahaba, they even knew the person who he most looked like. And we see as well, at the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him, there was a man whose name was Ibn Sayyad. Now Ibn Sayyad claims in the city of Medina that he could read people's minds. And this was at the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him. He claimed that he could read the minds of the people. So a lot of people started to believe this. They started to talk about him. Oh, he can read people's minds. He knows some parts of the future. And so the Prophet, peace be upon him, became concerned about this. So he came to Umar, radiallahu anhu, saying to him, what should we do about this man? And so Umar, radiallahu anhu, had the usual conclusion Usually when there was someone making trouble or there was a problem, Omar radiallahu an had the same solution, which was to remove his head. Omar radiallahu an, this was usually the answer to most problems, kill him. But the Prophet, peace be upon him, said no. If we kill him, then the people are going to say that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam kills his own people. Because this was a man who claimed to be a Muslim. He claimed that he was a Muslim. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, didn't want to start a fitna so that the people would say, Muhammad, peace be upon him, is killing his followers. So the Prophet, peace be upon him, and Omar, radiallahu anh, went to go visit him. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, you claim that you can see what is in the people's minds. If this is so, what can you see in my mind? Now, of course, the Prophet, peace be upon him, is not asking him to tell him his fortune 
or to claim these things. He was merely testing him to expose him. And so he said, if you can see what's in the people's minds, then tell me what's in my mind. And so he said, aduch, aduch. It's very unclear, smoky, smoky. I can't see, I can't see. And so the Prophet, peace be upon him, made it very clear that this person is not able to read the minds. Rather, it may be that he works with some of the jinn, so that the jinn, because we know that every person has a jinn, a qarin that comes with him, and there are many jinn that can see us and hear us. All it is is that he speaks to a jinn, and then the jinn would tell him about these affairs. The Prophet, peace be upon him, showed us how he does his tricks. There's nothing amazing about this. And so the Prophet, peace be upon him, said to Omar, because Omar, now he, again, he wanted to kill him. He said, if this is the case, he should be killed. Because it could be that he is Al-Masih al-Dajjal. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, no. He is not Al-Masih al-Dajjal. Because if he was Al-Masih al-Dajjal, you would not be able to kill him. If he was, you would not be able to kill him. We're going to explain a little bit more about this later. Now, there was a Sahabi whose name was Tamim al-Dari radiallahu an. And Tamim, he used to be a Christian and he embraced Islam. Tamim al-Dari radiallahu an once went with some of the other Sahaba on a boat. They went from Al-Madinah and they traveled to the east of Al-Madinah meaning somewhere in the Indian Ocean, where Allah knows best. They traveled out to the east, and their boats became stranded on an island. They landed on an island, and the boat was destroyed. So they had to fix their boat in order to get back to al Medina. Now, when they were on the island, some specific events occurred. And when they made it back to al Medina, they told the Prophet ﷺ about this. And so the Prophet, peace be upon him, ordered for the call to be made for the people to come to the masjid. So they came to Masjid al Nabawi, and the Prophet, peace be upon him, introduced Tamim radiallahu anh, to the people. Because many of them didn't know Tamim, because he was still a new Muslim. Many of them hadn't met him. So he said, This is Tamim. And he said to Tamim, Relate to them what happened to you and your companions on this island. And so he said, and this is narrated in Sahih Muslim. This hadith is narrated in Sahih Muslim. We don't have any doubt as to its authenticity. Tamim radiallahu an said, we became stranded on this island. And then when we were journeying around the island, trying to find things to you know, fix, uh, fix our boat, he said, we came across what looked like a beast. We came across a person, a man, who looked like a beast. His body was entirely covered in hair. He was covered from head to foot in, his, in hair. And he said in his words, you could not tell his face from his backsides. He was a disgusting looking creature covered in hair. And he spoke to them. And he said to them, I am Al-Jassas. And I have been waiting for you. He said, there is somebody who is waiting to see you. He is over there in this monastery and he's been waiting some time for you. Go over there to see him. And so, of course, Tamim and the other companions, by this time, they're very careful. After they see this talking beast saying, I am al Jassas, and there's somebody waiting for you. They're wondering, what is this? So very carefully, very carefully, they make their way over to this monastery. And so they went in and they saw a man who was chained. He was chained by his arms, his neck, and his feet. And he had been in that way for a very long time. And he fits the description that the Prophet, peace be upon him, had told them about Al-Masih al-Dajjal. So he said to them, who are you? And from where have you come? So they introduced themselves that they're from al Medina, And he asked, has he come among you yet? Has the man, the Prophet who has been promised, has he come among you? And they said, yes, verily we are his companions. And so he said to them, there will come a time not too long from now when I will be free. And this was Al-Masih al-Dajjal. And so, yes, we know that Al-Masih al-Dajjal is present on this earth at this very time. Just like Ya'juj and Ma'juj are also present. Just like Isa alayhi salam is alive with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so too is Al-Masih al-Dajjal. 
So we don't ask how is he alive. In the same way that Allah has allowed Ya'juj and Ma'juj to be alive, and Isa alayhi salam to be alive, to return, so too he is alive. Shaitan is alive. Iblis has been alive from the beginning of creation up until now. If Allah should decree that a person would be alive for a long time, so they would be. Just as the prophets of the past, Nuh alayhi salam lived for a very long time. Adam alayhi salam lived for a very long time. So too al Masih al-Dajjal is alive. Now the Prophet, peace be upon him, told us about the signs of his coming. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said that one of the signs of his coming was that for one whole year, for one whole year, one third of the earth would go without any rain. Meaning there would be droughts upon one third of the earth. And then a second year would follow it, in which two thirds of the earth would not have any rain. And then a third year would follow in which the entire earth would be in drought. There would not be any rain. Now this might seem strange to us. How could it be that there would be a whole year without rain? Or a whole year where two thirds of the world has no rain? Let alone one year where only one third of the world doesn't have any rain. Yet I'm going to surprise you. And I'm going to tell you that this year is not going to have any rain on one third of the earth. I can almost guarantee you this, that this entire earth, one third of it will not have any rain. This will happen this year, just like it happened last year and the year before. Every single year, one third of the earth has no rain. This is what we call a desert. To qualify as a desert, you have to have no rain. One third of the world is occupied by desert. Who knows what the largest desert in the world is? Sahara, no. Sorry? Australia? No. Allah Hadik. Gobi, no. The world's largest desert is Antarctica. Because remember I just told you what qualifies to be a desert? That there's no rain whatsoever. Antarctica has no rain whatsoever. No rain, no snow. Antarctica is actually the world's largest desert. Now when you put together all of the world's largest deserts, meaning Antarctica, the Gobi, the Sahara, all of these, you'll find that they occupy one third of the world. This means every single year, one third of the world receives no rain. So don't be surprised about this sign. And I'm sure a whole year where two thirds of the world would not get any rain, a lot of us probably wouldn't even realize about this because large parts of the world are occupied by ocean. The Pacific Ocean is far larger than any continent. The Indian Ocean is far larger than any continent. It would easily go unnoticed. It's possible that these two years could come by. But the reality is that yes, even large parts of the world will suffer from this. In the last year, one third of the world will have no rain. There will be a drought. Now we already know for ourselves, I mean, we had a mini drought in Australia and we were already, you know, suffering. The cost of water increased. People were unable to grow vegetables and fruits as much as they normally would. Animals would suffer because there's no more grass. Now imagine the effect that some parts of the world would have had three years without rain. Some had two and some had one. The entire earth would be suffering. Fruits and vegetables would skyrocket in price. There would actually be very few. You cannot have fruits and vegetables when there's a whole year without rain. You can't go to the fruit market anymore. Animals would be dying. No water. No grass. Meat is going to become a very rare commodity. You see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is now preparing the world for the coming of Al-Masih al-Dajjal. People are going to be suffering. There is going to be widespread famine. Drought will have taken over the earth. And then, after that third year, he will be released. Al-Masih al-Dajjal will be released and he will make his way directly to Persia. He will make his way directly to Iran. As the Prophet ﷺ told us, that Al-Masih al-Dajjal will make his way to Khurasan. Now Khurasan is a region, a historical region that covers what is mostly Iran and Afghanistan and a small bit of Uzbekistan. 
And we find in Iran today, their eastern province is called what? It's called Khurasan province. Up until today. So we know that Al-Masih al-Dajjal, as soon as he comes, will make his way directly to Iran. And of course, we're going to see there's a reason why. So he will come and he will announce himself there. How will he announce himself? Is he going to say, I am Al-Masih al-Dajjal? No, he's not going to claim this. This is what we call him. What's he going to call himself? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not Mahdi, not Messiah. He will claim that he is Allah. So he will go there and he will claim himself that he is Allah. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said that he will be accompanied. He will be accompanied by a people whose faces are like flat beaten iron. Their faces are flat like beaten iron. And because of this, many of the people in the past when they saw the Mongols, the army of Genghis Khan, they said, these will be the people who are with Al-Masih al-Dajjal. Because that's how their faces were. You see the Mongols, their faces are flat like beaten iron. This is why they thought the Mongols would be his followers. Now we know up until today, the inhabitants of this area are the descendants of the Mongols. Abu Yusuf, Sahwalala. They are descendants of the Mongols. The Hazara in western Afghanistan, in the east of Iran. They're descended from the Mongols. Look at their facial features. The Prophet ﷺ said his followers would come from this area with these characteristics. And so, he will go with his army. Al-Masih al-Dajjal will go with his army. And he will have many followers. Many, many followers among him. And he will take his army and he will meet the Muslims. Almost instantly, he will go with his army and he will meet the Muslims. Where will he meet the Muslims? In between Syria, Syria and Iraq. Now this is important to note. He's going to come from this region. He's going to go towards the west and he's going to meet the Muslims to fight them in between Syria and Iraq. And a battle will take place. This will be the beginning of the greatest battle. The battle between the forces of good and the forces of evil. The forces of Al-Masih al-Dajjal and the forces of the Ummah of Islam. Because at that time, the Muslims will be in power in between Syria and Iraq. This is a bright sign for the Ummah. This is a very bright sign that Syria will fall and it will come under our control. Iraq will fall and it will be under our control. Because this is where he goes to meet who? Who does he go to fight? The forces of the Khilafah. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said, Verily there will come a man. And he described his characteristics. And he said, When he comes, you should go to give him your bay'ah, your pledge of allegiance. Even if you have to crawl over ice, you should go to him. For verily he is the Khalifa of Allah. He is Imam Mahdi. So Imam Mahdi will be the Khalifa, the ruler of the Khilafah, the Muslim state. And they will have power in between Syria and Iraq. This is a bright promise. As we know, the Prophet, peace be upon him, said that this Ummah would go from the Buwa, from prophethood, to the Khulafa al-Rashidin, to successive kingship, to tyranny. The Ummah would slowly go down until we enter the stage that we're in now of the tyrants. And then it will return to the Khilafah upon the Manhaj of Nabuwa, upon the way of prophethood. So this is a sign that yes, Bashar al-Assad will be defeated. This is a sign that the Alawis will be defeated. This is a sign that Syria, the land of Asham, and the land of Iraq will be in our power, insha'Allah. Because this is the promise of Allah, that the Khilafah will return. And we will rule over these lands. And so the forces of the Ummah, the forces of the Islamic Khilafah will fight against Al-Masih al-Dajjal. And this will be the beginning of this immense battle. So between Iraq and Syria they will meet. And among the followers of al-Dajjal, Coming from this area of Khurasan, you will have 70,000 Yahud. 70,000 Yahud coming from the city of Isfahan. Isfahan is one of the cities in Iran. 
Now, one thing that may amaze you is that there's many Jews in Iran. In the entire Middle East, the Jews are centered in two countries. Six million of them in Israel, and the second largest amount are in Iran. This is no surprise. You go to the city of Isfahan today, they have their synagogues. There are tens of thousands of them already in Isfahan. Just add a few more that meet them there. And then you're going to have easily that number of 70,000. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, said that they will join him, 70,000 of them, with their prayer shawls. And this is a miracle of the Prophet ﷺ. He said they will wear their garments, their prayer shawls, and they will be striped. They're striped prayer shawls. Now, anyone who has seen the Yahud today, when they wear their prayer shawls, they're white with two dark blue or black stripes. At the time of the Prophet, peace be upon him, they didn't wear these. It was unknown. This is a new thing that they started to do. You'll see, for example, in the Israeli army, when there's a more religious soldier, a religious Jewish soldier, he always wears the prayer shawl around him. You'll see entire battalions of the Jewish Israeli army, the Zionist army, wearing their striped prayer shawls. The Prophet ﷺ told us, without having seen these prayer shawls in his life, that 70,000 of the followers of Al-Masih al-Dajjal, coming from Isfahan, will be wearing these prayer shawls. He said they will follow him, the Yahud will follow him. But it won't just be the Yahud. There will be many Muslims following him too. There's no doubt about it, many Muslims will follow him. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said that the largest among them would be the Jews, the Persians. What does Persian mean in our day? Iran. There will be many Iranians following him. After that, you will have many Turks. And of course, Turk doesn't just mean Turkey. Turk covers all the way from Turkey up until Western China. Azerbaijan, for example, is the Turkic country. Turkmenistan. These are Turkic countries. You will have many Turks and Bedouins following him. And among them, a large amount, a massive amount of his followers will be women. So this is who's going to make up the bulk of his army. Jews, Iranians, per, uh, Turks, and Bedouins. And, so, and many women who will follow him. Whether or not the women will make up the army, Allah knows best, but he will have many followers who are women. And we'll talk a little bit about this later. Now from the initial battles that will take place, from that initial battle and others, you will find that the Muslims will be heavily defeated. Yes, you'll have the, you will have the Khilafah. You will have an Islamic state. But they're not going to be powerful enough to fight against the forces of Al-Masih al-Dajjal. He's going to defeat the Muslims wherever he meets them. Anywhere in the world, he's going to defeat them. And you'll find, as I said, having come after a drought, he's going to come to the people with a mountain of bread and a mountain of meat. What do we mean by a mountain? A massive amount. As if he has an entire mountain of bread and meat. Now understand, in our days it doesn't seem that impressive. Go to the supermarket, you can get a lot of bread and meat. But this is coming after that drought. Bread will almost not exist. Meat, forget about it. Nobody's going to be able to have or afford meat. So here he comes with a mountain of bread and meat. And so the people who are starving, many of whom probably haven't seen meat in a good year, he will offer it to them. And they're going to be wondering, how did he get all of this bread and this meat? Of course, he's going to tell them, he is Allah. You want bread and meat? He will bring it. And so he will ask the people to worship him as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And many people through starvation will accept. They will say I'll, say, I'll say that you are God if you like. Just give me something to eat. You would find that he would come to a place and he would command for it to rain and it will rain. Remember, some of these people haven't seen rain for three years. He would say, verily, I am Allah. And he would say, rain, and it will instantly begin to rain. And fruits will come out of the ground in an instant. Fruits and vegetables, which they haven't seen for a long time, they will come out in an instant. Of course, this is a test from Allah that he allows. He will tell it to rain and it rains. Fruits and vegetables will come. Wherever he will go, he will do this. And if the people reject him, 
Meaning, well, they're going to say, well, now that fruit and vegetable has come, we don't need you. So he would say, if you reject me, all of it will disappear in an instant. It was there. Fruit and vegetables. You reject me, he will destroy all of it. He will take all of it away in an instant. So that people would truly believe that he is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wherever he goes in the entire earth, he will bring treasures. Treasures such as gold. All of these valuable things, he'll bring them from nowhere. You want treasures? He will give you treasures. Like that. From nowhere it will appear. You would find that he will go across the earth, as the Prophet peace be upon him said, like the wind. Wind. How long does it take wind to cover the earth? It goes in an instant. Covers the entire earth. He will cover the entire earth, traveling across it like wind, entering all of the places of the earth. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, said after this, If you see him, or you think that he's coming, don't even try to face him. Yes, he will come over the entire earth. If you believe he's coming, don't even try to face him. Don't think that you can fight him. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said, If you know he's coming, flee. If you know that he's coming, and his forces are coming, flee. Don't stay Get out of there. This is why the Prophet ﷺ told us that the first 10 verses of Surah Al-Kahf are a protection from Al-Masih Al-Dajjal. Many of us know this. You've heard this before, haven't you? Why are they a protection? What are the first 10 verses of Surah Al-Kahf about? Who knows? MashaAllah, you've all memorized it, haven't you? This is something strange. The early Muslims, all of them would memorize the first 10 verses of Surah Al-Kahf because they wanted to be protected from Al-Masih Al-Dajjal. Most of us, we don't even know what the first 10 verses are about. It's about the young people. Young people who believed in their Lord. Yet they were living among wicked people, so they had to escape. They escaped to go live in the cave, meaning they isolated themselves. They escaped fitna to live far away to be protected. This is why the Prophet, peace be upon him, is telling us to know these verses so that we too can prepare to flee. If you know Al-Masih Al-Dajjal is coming, do not stay, nor try to face him. Get out of there. And this is the command of the Prophet ﷺ. This is how intense the fitna is going to be. We have to be spiritually prepared, not physically prepared. You can't fight him. You're not going to be able to defeat him. Prepare yourself spiritually so that your iman will be strengthened, so that you will be able to flee at this time. Now, to add to the fitan, the trials he's going to bring, I mean, I've already told you many of these apparent miracles he will perform. This is just an introduction to what he's going to do. I want you to imagine, imagine right now that both of your parents have passed away. If they already haven't, you're an older person and both of your parents have passed away. Now imagine that your parents all of a sudden come back. All of a sudden you see your parents before you alive. And they say, oh my dear son, we are your parents. And Allah has given us life. Allah has given us life. And this man here, he is Allah. And you must accept him and worship him and follow him. This is your parents. The people who you love and respect more than anyone else in the world. They come before you saying, my dear son or daughter, Allah has given us life. And you should follow him. This is how intense the fitna of the time of Al-Masih Al-Dajjal is going to be. I mean, you can't even imagine. You can't imagine having your parents before you saying, this is Allah, follow him. Who would want to face this fitna? None of us would want to. Now we know that the Prophet, peace be upon him, told us that all it is, is that two jinn, two jinn go into the bodies of your parents. They take the form of your parents and they come to you saying, this is Allah, worship him. As for the believer, he knows it's two jinn. As for the person who doesn't know this, the average Muslim, do you really think they're going to, they're going to see their parents before them? My parents, where did you come from? You know, some people see their parents in dreams and they're convinced it has to have been my parents. This is in real life. They come before you. Saying, my son, worship him and follow him. For verily he is Allah. 
What do you think most of the people are going to do? What do you think the absent-minded and ignorant Muslim is going to do? So they will say to follow him, this is why our faith must be firm. If our faith is not firm and we don't know and we don't educate ourselves, we're going to end up being his followers. How many Muslims don't know about this? They've never heard this. They've never studied this. So they're not going to know any better. And no doubt many of them will follow him. So you're going to see that he will be like Al-Masih, Isa alayhi salam. What was the miracle of Isa alayhi salam? He would resurrect the dead. He would heal the sick by the power of Allah. So too, Allah will allow him to do some of these things. It will seem that he will be able to bring back the dead. But of course, he's not really bringing back the dead. This is why he is Al-Masih al-Dajjal. He is the false Messiah. He is the Antichrist. He will do things that make him seem like Al-Masih. But verily, he is not Al-Masih. Rather, all he does is uses the shayateen. But the people will be amazed. Bringing back the dead. Bringing back the parents. You will find that he will come to a young man and he will chop him in half. He will come to a young man and chop him in half. And walk in between the two halves of his body. And then they will be put back together. And this young man will still be alive. Imagine seeing this. People see these magicians levitate a little bit off the ground. Whoa, he must have powers. He's going to chop someone in half. This is not trickery. You know how the magicians, they put someone in a box and it looks like they're chopping them in half? No boxes, no trickery. He will chop them in half. Walk between them just to show you this is not illusion. He will be put back together and this young man would still be alive. He will come to the people with gardens. He will have gardens that are like no other. Gardens that are so beautiful that the people will think they're the gardens of Jannah. Of course, the gardens of Jannah are beyond our comprehension. But imagine, just imagine in your, moment, in your mind for a moment, how beautiful the gardens of Jannah would be. That's what he will come with, except even more beautiful. He will come with gardens, with rivers. A river that is so beautiful. A river that looks like milk. A river that is pure and a river that looks like fire, liquid fire, flowing, as Allah describes the gardens of Jannah. And he will tell the people, I have come with Jannah. You want Jannah? I have Jannah. And it will be so beautiful that the ignorant person will believe that this is Jannah. So you can imagine the trial that's going to take place. You can imagine for the average disbeliever, or weak Muslim, what's going to happen? We're going to stop here for Salat. Ah, 30 minutes till Salat. MashaAllah, still a little bit of time. We're not stopping for a little bit. So the fitna, the trial is going to be intense. Now, Tamim Adari, radiallahu an, the Sahabi that we mentioned earlier, he said, Al-Masih al-Dajjal will be able to enter, and he will enter all of the areas of the earth. He will enter into the towns and the cities of the entire earth, except for two cities. Which are they? Mecca and Medina. Now many Muslims incorrectly think that if you go to Medina, you will be saved from Al-Masih al-Dajjal. Have any of you heard this before? Many Muslims incorrectly think that if you go to Medina, you will be saved from the trials of Al-Masih al-Dajjal. Verily, it won't be the case. No, he won't be able to enter. But what's going to happen? He's going to get to the edge, to the border of al Medina, And he's going to look. And he will see, as the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, he will see the white palace of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Again, this is one of the miracles of the Prophet, peace be upon him. When you stand on Mount Uhud, or Jabal Roma, Jabal Roma, you can see... From a distance, Masjid al-Nabawi. And it's white. It looks like a palace. And as big as it is, it's going to be expanded in the coming years. It's going to be six to eight times as large as it is now. The Prophet, peace be upon him, didn't know what color it would be. He didn't know how large it would be. His masjid was made out of mud. Yet we see, he said, Al-Masih al-Dajjal will see from the edge of Medina, showing how large it is the white palace of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Now he won't be able to enter. But when he gets there, there will be an earthquake in Medina. There will be a massive earthquake. 
that will damage all of Al Medina. And then as soon as it ends, another earthquake will come. And as soon as that ends, a third earthquake will come. Three earthquakes will destroy and ravage Al Medina. You're not going to be safe in Al Medina. The people are going to flee. They know that he's there. They know that he's outside. And he's going to offer them sanctuary and protection. He will say to them, come out and follow me. And if they don't, the second earthquake would come. Then the third earthquake will come. And many of the people of al Medina will go out to join him. Out of fear of another earthquake. You know, most of us, especially the people who go for Hajj and they visit Medina, they come back saying, MashaAllah, Ahlul Medina. The people of Medina are the best of the best. They have the highest of Iman. They have the most taqwa. Yet even the people of al Medina are going to flee. Not all of them, but most of them are going to flee to join the forces of al Masih al-Dajjal. This is how intense the fitna is going to be. Tens of thousands of them will go to join him. And of course, the majority of them would be women. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said the men of Medina would be tying their wives and mothers and sisters Physically tying them for fear that they would go out to join Al-Masih al-Dajjal. They would be fleeing, trying to join him. And a husband would be stopping his wife, his mother and his sister from going out to join them. This will be a time of intense fitna. Abu Sa'id al-Khudri radiallahu an narrated that a man from among the believers, a young man from among the believers of al Medina, will come to him. He's a believer. He's not going to join him. But he will go out to the edge of al Medina and he will see the forces, the army of Imam, uh, sorry, Imam Mahdi, of al Masih al Dajjal. And he will come to them and they will say, Have you come to join us? And he will say, No. They will say, Aren't you here to join us? He will say, No, I'm not. And so they would say, Kill him. He's not here to join us. Kill him. But then one of them would say, no, verily our Lord has told us not to kill anyone from this city until they're brought to him. And of course, by their Lord, who were they referring to? Masih al-Dajjal, because they believe that he's Allah. They're going to say, Allah has told us not to kill any of the people of al Medina, of these young men, until we bring them to him. And so he will be brought to al Masih al-Dajjal. And he will come to them. In front of their leader. And as soon as he sees him, he will call out to the people. And he will say, Oh people, verily this man is Al-Masih al-Dajjal. This man is the one who the messenger told us about. He is the false messiah. He is the antichrist. And so the Dajjal will order that he be laid flat on his stomach. The forces, the soldiers are going to grab him, throw him on his stomach and smash his head. And continue to beat him on his heads. And so the Masih had the jail would say, Do you believe in me now? Do you not believe in me now? And he would say, No, for verily you are Al Masih had the jail. And so they will continue to beat him. They will continue to punish and torture him. And the Prophet the the Prophet Al Masih had the jail, as the Prophet peace be upon him told us, Masih had the jail would order that he would be cut into two. From his head down to his genitals, he will be split into two. And Al Masih had Dajjal will walk between him as he did with all of the other people. And then he would say, Arise! And up he would come, put back together, and he would be alive. And he would say, Do you not believe in me now? And so this young man would say, My certainty has only increased that verily you are Al Masih had Dajjal. And he will say to the people, he will not be able to do this again to anyone from the creation. Meaning he will not be able to cut anyone else in half and walk between them and bring them back. How does this young man know? Because he's read this hadith. He's going to know that he's the young man in this hadith. He has knowledge. He's informed about this. As for the majority of Muslims, they don't know about this. You're going to see what makes him be able to know that he's Al-Masih al-Dajjal because he knows about the words of the Prophet 
This is why we have to educate ourselves. Now, don't think for a moment that you are this young man. A lot of us are going to think, it could be me. I know about it. I could be in Medina at the time. It's not you. The Prophet ﷺ said, if you know he's there, flee, get out of there. So the command of the Prophet, peace be upon him, is to flee. Not to go face him. To go the opposite direction. So even if you're in Medina at that time, don't get your hopes up. You're not this young man. The order is for you to get out of there. And so Al-Masih Haddajal will grab a sword ready to cut his throat. But when he strikes him, Allah will place a protection there for him. And he will not be able to cut off his head. And so he will command the people to grab him. And they will grab this young man by his hands and by his feet. And he will say, throw him into the hellfire. Because he's told his people that this river, this pure river, leads to Jannah. And the river of fire is the river of the hellfire. So he will say, grab him and throw him into the hellfire. And they will throw him into the fire. And the people will say, how wicked was this young man, for now he is in the fire of hell. But the Prophet, peace be upon him, told us, verily he is in Jannah. For this river, the river of fire, it leads to Al-Jannah. The Prophet, peace be upon him, told us, if any of you, if any of you are to face Al-Masih Ad-Dajjal and you cannot escape, rather than remaining in being subject to the trial and the fitna, he said, jump into this fire. Jump into this fire, for verily it will lead to, to Jannah. Now this in itself is a test. I mean, we as human beings, from the time that you're a young child, you're taught to keep your hands away from fire. You put your hand a little bit near fire. You can't even touch it. How hard would it be to throw yourself into a river of fire? It's going to be a very intense fitna. You either remain and risk becoming one of his followers, or you become tortured and beaten by them, or you throw yourself into the river of fire. This is how intense the fitna would be. And so the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, هَذَا أَعْذَمُ النَّاسِ شَهَادَةً عِنْدَ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ this young boy will be the greatest of people to attain shahada, martyrdom, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He will be the greatest of shuhada in all of history. Now, and so, remember, just again, if you see Al-Masih Haddajal, flee from him. If you can't flee, jump into this river of fire. Now, Al-Masih Haddajal is going to reign for 40 days. Al-Masih Haddajal is going to reign, meaning he's going to rule on earth for 40 days. The Prophet, peace be upon him, told us that the first day will be equivalent to a year. The second day will be equivalent to a month. And the third, like a week, and the rest of them will be like normal days. Now when I say this to you, what's the first thought that comes into your mind? What are you thinking? Somebody tell me what you're thinking. Sorry? I mean, if I'm saying he's going, to, he's going to rule. And the first day will be like a year. The second day will be like a month. The third day will be like a week. And the rest will be normal days. His power is decreasing. Anyone else, what do you think of? Ah, you know this, don't you? You see the difference between most of us and the Sahaba. Most of us, when we hear this, ajib, a year, a day like a year, how can a day be like a year? Maybe the sun will start, or, or maybe it means that this, and you find a lot of people looking into these theories, and this is where Imran Hussein gets very misguided. He said, well, a year, sorry, a day like a year refers to the British Empire, who ruled for a very long time. The second day like a month refers to the American Empire, who will rule for a lesser time. And the third day refers to the Zionist empire, who will rule for what seems like a week. Making ta'wil, this is nonsense. The Sahaba, radiallahu anhum, as soon as they heard the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa say this, what did they ask? They said, Ya Rasulullah, how will we pray on that day? How will we pray on that day? Because they know if there's a day like a year, the timings for the salat aren't going to be normal. 
Ya Rasulullah, how will we pray? That shows their concern, subhanAllah, worried about the salat. They're not worried about conspiracy theories. They're not worried about all of this nonsense of how will it be. Ya Rasulullah, how will we pray? And so the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, estimate the time. Estimate the time. This again shows it's going to be a literal thing. It's not a metaphor. It's not a figurative expression talking about this empire or that empire. It means it will be literal. There will be a day like a year. A day like a month, a day like a week, and the rest normal days. If you're alive in those times, estimate your salat. You know when you go to the North Pole? When you go to the North Pole, there's actually a whole day that lasts like a year. A day that lasts like a whole year. You have six months, or you have a whole year of darkness, a whole year of light. This is amazing. A day, that, sorry, six months of darkness, six months of light. This is a day that goes like a year. And so the ulama, when they were faced with problems of Muslims living in Scandinavia, living in northern Scotland, living in you know, Greenland and these areas, the people said, how do we pray? Do we only pray five salat in the year? Based upon this hadith, they said no, estimate it. Estimate it. Meaning pray according to one of the you know, closest cities. Or some of them said pray according to the timing of Mecca. How do we fast? Estimate it. So you see this hadith, even the fuqaha, they would pass rulings judging by this command of the Prophet, peace be upon him, to estimate the time. Now why do I say estimating the time for salat? Is it time for salat? I think it's half an hour, Khalil. Okay, we'll stop now to pray anyway because it is 4.30. We'll stop to pray now inshallah and uh, we'll pray our salat al-asr and we'll come back and we'll continue with the rest of the topic inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So as we were last talking about, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that the Masih al-Dajjal would rule for 40 days. The first day like a year, the second like a month, the third like a week, and the rest for normal days. Now the Prophet, peace be upon him, told us that every single place that Al-Masih al-Dajjal goes to, the Muslims will fight him. Everywhere he goes, there will be Muslims. He will fight them and they will fight him. So this war that he's going to be fighting is going to be fought over the entire globe. With possibly the entire Muslim Ummah fighting him. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said sometimes they will be part of a combined army. And sometimes they will be separated. Meaning the combined army refers to the Islamic State. Referring to the Khilafah. Fighting under the Islamic leadership. And sometimes they would be disunited. Brothers. So sometimes... The Muslims would fight him as part of the combined Muslim army. And sometimes they would fight him separately. This is an indication as well that of course the Khilafah is not going to encompass the entire Muslim world. Rather it's going to be centered in Asham. It's going to be centered in Asham. It will cover parts of Iraq if not the entire parts. But it's not going to conquer the entire Muslim world. And we know that its capital is going to be where? The Prophet, peace be upon him, told us, no, it's not Damascus. The Prophet, peace be upon him, told us that the capital of the Islamic Khilafah, which will turn, will be in? In Jerusalem, in the city of Al-Quds. What does this imply? The Zionist pigs will be defeated. The Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa said that this affair, meaning the Khilafah, will begin in Medina. I can't remember the exact wording of the hadith. Then it will go to Al-Baghdad. Then it will go to the city, which is Istanbul, Constantinople. And it would continue until it reaches the city of Beit al-Maqdis, the city of Al-Quds of Jerusalem. And it will remain there 
And if anybody takes it away from there, it will never return. Meaning that the Khilafah will be re-established and its capital will be Al-Quds. And that will be the last capital of the Islamic State. For if it's taken away from Al-Quds, it would never return. So this shows as well that after Al-Quds being the capital, there's not much time left. The Khilafah won't be re-established after that if it's taken away. Because we're in the last days. The sign of the coming of the Masih Dajjal is one of the major signs of the last days. The Prophet peace be upon him said the signs of the last day would come as if you had a bracelet with many beads. If you were to cut it, the beads would fall one after another in quick succession. These are how, these are how the signs of the last day would appear. One would begin, boom, they would all come at once. So know that the coming of a Masih Dajjal is one of the signs of the last day. As we mentioned in the talk last night, the Prophet peace be upon him said, how can I live in comfort and ease? How can I live in comfort and ease without worries when I know that Allah has commanded the angel that will blow the trumpet to place the trumpet to his lips, ready, just waiting for the command of Allah to blow. And then the entire world would end. So no, without a doubt, we are in the last days. We're seeing some of the minor signs before us. As we said, the building of these large towers, it's happening before our eyes. Don't think for a moment that we're not in the last days. Don't think for a moment these things are not going to occur in your life. It is very likely that many of us may live to see these days. This is why we need to be prepared. And so the Prophet, peace be upon him, told us that the Muslims would fight Al-Masih had the jail wherever he goes. And the bulk the main force that will fight against Al-Masih al-Dajjal will be led by Imam Mahdi. This means the largest contingent that will fight against him will be led by the Khalifa. This shows that the Khilafah will take power over a large part of the Muslim world so that the majority of the forces that fight Al-Masih al-Dajjal will be from the Khilafah. So we know that Imam Mahdi, who's another character in this story if you like another protagonist he will precede the Dajjal he will come before Al-Masih al-Dajjal he will already be ruling when Al-Masih al-Dajjal comes however we don't know who he's going to be nor does he know who he's going to be this means that it's very likely that he won't be the first Khalifa it's very, very likely that he will not be the first Khalifa, nor does the Prophet, peace be upon him, tell us that he will be the first Khalifa. Otherwise, it would be obvious who it would be. And you'd see amongst the Khulafa of the past, there would be, for example, a prophecy of the Prophet, peace be upon him, and they would strive to fulfill it, not knowing if they would be that person. For example, the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, لَتَفْتَهُنَ الْقُنْسْتَنْتِينِيَّةِ وَلَا نِعْمُ عَمِيرُ أَمِيرُهَا وَلَا نِعْمُ جَيْشْ ذَلِكَ الْجَيْشْ he said, verily you will conquer Constantinople and blessed will be its emir and blessed will be that army. And he said, the army that co attacks Constantinople, their sins would be forgiven. So many of the Khulafa, they wanted to be this emir. So they would strive to attack it, but none of them knew who would be the one who would conquer it. And of course, in the end, we know it was Sultan Fatih, Muhammad al-Fatih, rahimahullah. Of course, he didn't know that he would be the one, but he did. So there possibly will be many Khulafa, some of them knowing that they could be Imam Mahdi, but they won't know for sure that it's going to be him. So we see that the world will be divided into these two groups. It's not going to be like there are going to be many superpowers involved. It is going to be a war between Iman and Kufr. It's going to be a war between the forces of Al-Masih al-Dajjal, who by that point is going to have many people following him. Many, many forces from all over the world. Everywhere he goes, he will conquer and defeat the people. And the forces of Islam, the forces led by Al-Imam Mahdi. And of course, actually we'll get to this a little bit later, I don't want to ruin anything. Now towards the end of the rule of Al-Dajjal, how long is he going to rule for? 40 days. Towards the end of this rule, his forces will be attacking the army of Imam Mahdi, which by that point has become very weak. 
As I said, everywhere he goes, he will defeat the Muslims. So by now, the Muslims, the Islamic Khilafah is very weak. And they've actually withdrawn all the way into the city of Al-Quds, their capital city. Of course, you defend your capital more than anything else. So they've withdrawn. Imam Mahdi will give the order that all of the forces should come back to Al-Quds for a final stand. To protect the Khilafah so that it would not be destroyed. And so they would go. And they would lock themselves. They would barricade themselves into the city of Al-Quds. To stop the army of Al-Masih al-Dajjal from entering. And so they're waiting. They're waiting. This massive army who's defeated them everywhere they went. And now there they are waiting in Al-Quds. Waiting for the final attack to occur. At that point, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send a help from the heavens. When the Muslims are at their weakest point, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send one of his great soldiers and warriors who will descend from the heavens. Allah the Almighty will send Isa alayhi salam. Jesus, peace be upon him, will return. He will descend upon the city of Damascus Resting himself, on the wish, resting himself on the wings, on the shoulders of two angels. And he will descend. He will descend. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, even told us which minaret in the masjid of Damascus he would descend to. And so Isa alayhi salam will return to earth. And he will make his way straight to Al-Quds. He will go straight away to Al-Quds without delay. From Damascus, he will go to Jerusalem, to the capital of the Khilafah. And he will find the Muslims getting ready to pray. Because he will arrive at the time of Salat al-Fajr. And so the Muslims are there. The Adhan has been made for Fajr. They're standing up, ready to pray behind their Imam. Behind their Imam who is Imam Mahdi. And so Isa alayhi salam will join the lines. He will join the first row of the salat. Now imagine this, subhanAllah. Imagine you're praying in this jama'ah. Your imam is Imam Mahdi. Standing next to you is Isa alayhi salam. Ya Allah. How would this be? Who wouldn't want to be among them? The Prophet ﷺ said, when you know he's here, go to him to give him your bay'ah, even if you have to crawl over ice. Yet you know how many Muslims there's going to be behind him? How many Muslims in that jama'ah? 1,200. How many Muslims do we have now in the world? About 1.7 billion? There's going to be 1,200 Muslims. After all of the fitan that have taken place, after all of the death and destruction, the believers will only be 1,200 in number. 800 of them men and 400 of them women. And so this blessed jama'ah will go to pray Salat al-Fajr. Now Imam Mahdi, because of the small group, he knows everyone in his army. He knows who they are. He looks to his jama'ah just after the iqamah is made. He's ready to pray. He looks to the jama'ah and he sees a face that he's never seen before. He sees a face that he's never seen before. And at that point he realizes that he is Imam Mahdi. For the face that he sees is that of Isa alayhi salam. And so he says, this is a prophet. How can you pray when there's a prophet in your jama'ah? He will say to him, come and lead the salat. But Isa alayhi salam will say, no. The iqamah was made for you, and so you lead the salat. And so he will lead them in salat al-fajr. Ya Allah, imagine being there at that time, in this jama'ah. You have the forces of al-Masih al-Dajjal outside the city waiting to besiege you. You have Imam Mahdi leading you. And possibly, we would assume, two people are going to be praying right next to Isa alayhi salam. Imagine this, next to you is Isa. Ya Allah, what a blessed jama'ah this is. So they will pray Salat al-Fajr. They will pray their prayer. And as soon as they finish, Isa alayhi salam will stand and he will rise and he will command the Muslims, open the gates. Remember the Muslims are afraid. This massive army coming to destroy these 1,200 believers. 
And he will stand and he will command them with no fear. Open the gates. Let them in. And so the Muslims, they will hesitate. They don't want to open the gates. But Isa has commanded them. So they will go forth. They will open the gates. And the army of Al-Masih Haddajal will pour inside. They will pour inside the gates, killing every Muslim that they can see. And at their head will be Al-Masih Haddajal. And so Al-Masih Haddajal, this is his victory that he's been waiting for. He's about to destroy the Muslims. He's going to kill their leader. He will finish them off and his war is complete. This is the victory that he has promised his believers. He's been telling them the whole time, we will finish them off and the world will be ours. And they have no doubt in their hearts because they believe that they're led by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so the forces will pour in. And Al-Masih Haddajal, he will go, he will enter. And Isa alayhi salam will be standing there waiting for him. As soon as Al-Masih Haddajal sees him, as soon as he sees him, the fear in him is so great that he, as the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, he would turn around and begin to run and he would begin to disintegrate. Like out of fear, he would disintegrate. And Isa alayhi salam, as fast as anything, would run forth with a spear in his hands and he would grab Al-Masih al-Dajjal and he would put his spear inside of him and kill him and take it out and hold it up high so that everyone can see the blood of their Lord. They can see the blood of Al-Masih al-Dajjal. They can see the blood of their false leader. And they would know that indeed... He has been killed by Isa alayhi salam. And so that's it. So they've been defeated. Yes, there's a massive army, but they're only fighting the Muslims because they believe that their leader is Allah. As soon as Isa alayhi salam kills him, every single one of them will stop. Every single one of them will lose hope. They will sit down confused, not knowing what to do. And the Muslims will be victorious. So this is the end of Al-Masih al-Dajjal. Killed by the noble messenger of Allah, Isa alayhi salam. But it doesn't end there. Yes, Al-Masih al-Dajjal is gone now. He's dead. Allah had decreed that only one person would be able to kill him. This is why the Prophet, peace be upon him, said, If you see him, flee, because you cannot kill him. This is why the Prophet, peace be upon him, said to Omar, You can't kill this man thinking he's Al-Masih Haddajal. For if he was Al-Masih Haddajal, you wouldn't be able to kill him. Because Allah has decreed that only Isa alayhi salam would be able to do so. So his forces have been defeated. Isa alayhi salam has come back. Now you could imagine at this point. I mean the Christians already claim that Isa is Allah. They already claim that he is Allah. So now imagine he's come back. He's just destroyed the Antichrist. Don't you think there's a fitna that some people are going to think that maybe Isa is Allah? There's a possibility. However, it's going to be very clear that this is not the case. Allah would ordain something. Allah would decree something that will make it very clear that Isa alayhi salam is not Allah. He's nothing but a slave and messenger of Allah. Allah will reveal to Isa alayhi salam Allah will reveal to him, actually sorry before I get to that, the Muslims would finish off all of that enemy. Anyone who continued to dare to fight them, they would be fought. This is the time where we know that the Prophet peace be upon him said, a Yahudi would hide behind a rock. A Yahudi would hide behind a rock or a tree and it would call out, O oh, Abdullah, O oh, servant of Allah, there is a Jew behind me, come kill him. And so their forces will be absolutely defeated. So now what happens? Isa alayhi salam, Imam Mahdi. Now they have absolute power, do they not? Isa alayhi salam will grab the followers and he will anoint their faces. Al-Masih in Arabic means somebody who anoints, somebody who does mas. So he will anoint their faces and he will tell them of their place in paradise. This blessed army of 1,200 
He will tell them of their place in paradise. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reveal a revelation to Isa alayhi salam. Allah will reveal that verily he has raised a people from among his creation that nobody can fight. Therefore gather my servants at the mountain of Atur. Now Atur, there are two mountains known as Atur. There's one in Palestine and there's one in Egypt. Which one of them it could be? Allah knows best. Allah will say to Isa, after he has just killed Al-Masih al-Dajjal, that he's going to raise an army, send an army, that nobody is going to be able to defeat. Not Imam Mahdi, not Isa alayhi salam. And so he will take the people away from Al-Quds and they will flee to Atur. Who, is, who are these people from the creation of Allah that Allah would send? Ya'juj and Ma'juj. Ya'juj and Ma'juj, as we know, Dhul Qarnain put them inside of a barrier and there they would remain until the end of times. And they would come closer and closer to breaking this barrier. One day the Prophet wasallam said, Woe to the Arabs! Woe to the Arabs! For verily, a hole has been placed in the barrier of Ya'juj and Ma'juj of this size. Woe to the Arabs on this day. So we know that they will appear. Allah will allow them to appear as soon as Al-Masih al-Dajjal is destroyed. And no army will be able to fight them. You thought that the army of Al-Masih al-Dajjal was something? The army of Ya'juj and Ma'juj is going to be far more intense. They will cause destruction on the earth unlike anything else ever seen. To the point that even Isa salam will not be able to defeat them. And then at the peak of their fasad, at the peak of their destruction and mischief, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will send a bug among them that would make them sick. And this sickness would destroy every single one of them. And this is one of the signs of the last day. After the coming of Ya'juj and Ma'juj, we don't know what will happen. Imam Mahdi is not mentioned anymore. It could be that he dies. And Isa alayhi salam will rule for the rest of his natural life. And so, this is what will happen. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam told us about this great fitna that's going to occur. Now remember that I asked you in the beginning, how many of us have heard people talking about Imam Mahdi during a Jummah khutbah on the minbar. None of us. None of us have heard this. Now I'm going to tell you one of the signs of the coming. Sorry, of Al-Masih al-Dajjal. I'm going to tell you of one of the signs that the Prophet, peace be upon him, told us. That must terrify you. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said. That one of the signs of the imminent coming of Al-Masih al-Dajjal. Is that nobody will talk about him for many years upon the minbar. Nobody will talk about him. Meaning the people will not discuss him. Throughout history, he has always been discussed. He has always been warned about by every prophet from Adam alayhi salam until Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. But just before he comes, nobody will talk about him on the minbars. This in itself is a sign that his coming will be very soon. How many years? We don't know. But I tell you, most of us, how long have we been alive for? Not one of us could probably remember a time that on the minbar, people were being warned about Al-Masih al-Dajjal. So do not think for a moment, as I said, that we're not in these last days. Don't think for a moment that this is going to be far away. Take a look at what's happening around us now. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said an army would march from Khurasan carrying black banners. And they will march onto Al-Quds, defeating those in their way. And they will give victory. They will give support and assistance to who? To Imam Mahdi. They will make the way easy for Imam Mahdi. As we said, where is Khurasan today? In Iran, Afghanistan, we find that an army has appeared in the land of Khurasan. And what banner do they carry? 
Do they carry the banner of nationalism or Arabism? No. What flag do we find the Mujahideen flying today? The black banner of Tawheed. All of the Mujahideen forces, be it Jabhat al-Nusra in Syria, be it Al-Qaeda in Yemen, be it Al-Shabaab in Somalia, be it a Taliban in Afghanistan, Khurasan, carrying this black banner of Tawheed. And they will march from Afghanistan onto Al-Quds, granting victory and assistance to Imam Mahdi. Now, if we were to say this was possible 20 years ago, you would laugh. How can you march from Afghanistan unto Al-Quds? You're going to face the governments of so many countries. Yet look at what's taking place today. You find Palestine is in a state of war. Next door in Syria, it's in a state of war. Syria, you can walk in and walk out. To get across the borders, it's no problem. From Syria to Iraq, Iraq is also in a state of war. The borders are uncontrolled. You can walk straight through. There's only one country in between Iraq and Afghanistan. And that is Iran. I'm not saying that Iran is going to be attacked soon. I'm not saying that it will go to war. But it's very likely that it will go to war. So that the forces of the Mujahideen from Afghanistan will be able to walk through into Al-Quds unhindered. Supporting the Mujahideen in their way until they reach Al-Quds and they defeat the Zionists. This is what's happening before us. Are we not awake? Are we not realizing this? Aren't we taking heed of the promise of the Prophet ﷺ and realizing what's happening before us today? Do you think that we're really that far from these times? History is repeating itself. We see that during the Crusades, the Holy Land, Asham, Al-Quds was occupied by the Crusaders. Central Asia, Baghdad, was occupied by the Mongols. What's happening today? Exactly the same thing. History is repeating itself. Al-Quds is occupied by the Zionists. Central Asia, Afghanistan, Baghdad is being occupied by the Americans. History is repeating itself. And just as they were defeated, the forces of the Crusaders and the Zionists today will be defeated. Except this defeat is going to lead to the greatest fitna that any of us have ever seen. Realize, dear brothers and sisters, that we're living in these times. That all of Asham is fighting you find that many of the ahadith specifically tell you of what's going to happen. You find some of the weak ahadith. They're not sahih, but they're weak ahadith that say someone from Bani Kalb, someone from Bani Kalb is going to oppress the Muslims. He's going to fight against the Muslims and he will be ferocious in oppressing them. Who knows what tribe Bashar al-Assad belongs to? What tribe does he belong to? We don't know. We're asleep. He belongs to Bani Kalb. Why do we think that we're not living in these times? It's our own ignorance that makes us unaware of these things. The Prophet ﷺ told us that the black banner will be raised. Is it befitting, therefore, that we hide behind any other banner? That we fly the flag of Palestine? Hand in hand with the socialists and the communists, thinking that they're going to grant us victory, Allah will grant us victory. March behind the banner of Tawheed. March behind the banner of the true Mujahideen of the Ummah. Grant them your support and make dua for them. For they will be the ones who will grant victory to this Ummah. Dear brothers and sisters, wake up and look around us. Afghanistan, Yemen, Somalia, Shishan, Mali, Xinjiang, Mindanao, Iraq. How many of our lands? How many of our lands? I can continue. There are so many more places that the Muslims are fighting. Why are they being fought? Why is it that Mali has been attacked in the last month? Mali has nothing. Somalia is one of the poorest countries in the entire world. Don't think... As some people say that America is attacking us for our oil. They're not. You know how much money they've spent on their war in Iraq? Trillions of dollars. If they were to take every last ounce of oil, they're not even going to make their money back. Why are they attacking us in Chechnya? Why are they attacking us in Yemen? It's not because of our wealth. 
It's because the people want to rule by the book of Allah. When our brothers in Al-Qaeda took power in Mali, and the brothers in the movement of Tawheed and Jihads, and the brothers in the movements in Mali took power, why were they fought? They have no wealth. All they have is the desire for Sharia. Somalia, what do they have? Nothing. But the Shabab and the Mahakim al Islamiya, all they did was want to rule by the Book of Allah. That is why we're being fought for our Aqeedah. We're being fought for the fact that we are Muslims. So let us live as Muslims and protect the Muslims and exist as one Ummah and realize that just as the Crusaders fought us and we were weak, heroes of the Ummah stood up. Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, Saifuddin Qutuz, Nuruddin Sanki, Salahuddin al Ayyubi. The heroes will arise from this Ummah today, and we see many of them among us today in this Ummah. Rise and be part of this. Don't fall asleep. We are in these times. We are in the last of days. And I ask Allah the Almighty to grant us victory and to protect us from the danger and the trial of Al-Masih al-Dajjal.